in the dimly lit corridors of the Rue Morgue magazine archives, nestled deep within a forgotten wing of the old library, there existed a collection of tales so unsettling that they were never meant for publication. One story in particular had a notorious reputation for disappearing from the records, only to be rediscovered by unfortunate souls. The tale begins on a stormy night with a young writer named Elise venturing into the archives to research for her upcoming horror novel. As lightning illuminated the labyrinthine shelves, she stumbled upon a dusty, leather-bound volume with no title, just an eerie emblem of an eye encased in a raven's wing. Compelled by curiosity, she opened the book, and the pages seemed to whisper, as if beckoning her to read. The first account was of a man who received midnight visits from a figure with no face, just a gaping maw where the mouth should be. The visitor would stand at the foot of the man's bed, whispering secrets of the afterlife until dawn. Elise felt a chill run down her spine, but she was hooked. Turning the page, she read about a mirror found in the ruins of an old estate, which showed not the reflection of its viewer, but rather a decaying version of their future self. It was said that those who gazed into it would vanish, leaving behind only a withering echo of their last scream, trapped within the glass. As the storm outside grew wilder, Elise read on, each story darker and more twisted than the last. She came upon an entry about a small, isolated town where the residents never spoke of the night. In this town, shadows moved with minds of their own, and anyone who dared to acknowledge them or speak of the strange occurrences after sunset would disappear, their houses found empty by morning. Elise felt a growing sense of dread, her eyes darting to the dark corners of the room, half expecting to see one of the sinister characters from the tales staring back at her. She turned to the next story, her hands trembling slightly, not noticing the way the shadows in the room seemed to lean closer, as if eager to read over her shoulder. The next tale was about a radio found in the attic of an old, abandoned house, which only played a strange, unidentifiable static that whispered names. Those who listened to it closely and heard their name would become obsessed with finding the source of the transmission, eventually leading them to a place from which they would never return. As the clock struck midnight, Elise realized that the room had grown significantly colder. The only sound was the rustling of the pages and her own shallow breaths. She felt a compelling urge to stop reading, but found herself unable to resist the pull of the stories. Just as she was about to read the next line, the lights flickered out, plunging her into darkness with only the sound of her heartbeat distant rumble of thunder filling the silence. In the brief moments when the lightning flashed, Elise thought she saw figures moving between the bookshelves, their outlines disturbingly familiar to the characters from the stories she had just read. Panic set in, and she realized that the tales in the book were not just stories, but warnings. With the book clutched tightly in her hands, Elise decided to leave, but when she looked up from the page, she found that the layout of the archives had inexplicably changed. The once familiar aisles of shelves now twisted and turned in impossible ways, creating a maze that seemed to have no end. And thus, Elise's journey through the shifting corridors of the Rue Morgue archives began, each turn revealing horrors that 
unidentified explanation. Horrors that seemed to have leaped from the pages of the cursed book she held. But what lies ahead for Elise? And what dark secrets will she uncover in the heart of the archives? That story is yet to be told. Elise, with the cursed book in hand, navigated through the morphing aisles of the Rue Morgue archives, her footsteps echoing in the silent, twisting labyrinth. The air was thick with a palpable sense of dread, and every shadow seemed to pulse with a life of its own. She tried to backtrack, hoping to find the room where she first discovered the book, but the layout of the archives had become a shifting maze its logic twisted by the dark energy emanating from the pages she held. As she moved deeper into the maze, the tales from the book began to bleed into reality. Whispers filled the air, each one reciting a different story from the volume, enveloping her in a symphony of terror. Elise realized that these were not just stories. They were memories each page, a captured moment of fear from someone's life, imprinted within the book. Suddenly, she stumbled into a clearing within the maze, where a single spotlight illuminated a grand, ornate mirror standing ominously alone. It was the mirror from one of the stories, the one that showed not your reflection, but your decaying future self. Despite her fear, Elise felt an irresistible pull towards it. As she peered into the glass, she saw not her future, but the past. The origins of the book and the archives themselves, revealing a history steeped in dark rituals and sacrifices made to unknown gods, all to imbue the book with its power. Realizing she was not just a victim, but a chosen participant in the book's legacy, Elise tried to flee. But the paths changed with her every turn, trapping her within the archives. It was then that she understood the book was alive in some way, feeding off the fears of those who read its tales, growing stronger with each retelling. As she navigated the endless maze, the barrier between the stories and reality continued to blur. Characters from the tales began to appear in the corridors, not just as specters, but as living entities, twisted and corrupted versions of the book's narratives. They seemed to be searching for something, or someone, perhaps a new protagonist for their never-ending tales of horror. Elise encountered other readers, lost souls who had been trapped in the archives for what seemed like eons, each one a warning of her potential fate. They were the forgotten, those who had succumbed to the madness of the book, their lives reduced to mere footnotes in its vast anthology of horror. Among these tormented figures, Elise met a former librarian of the Rue Morgue, a woman who had been missing for decades and was now part of the archive's living history. She told Elise of the book's creator, a mad archivist who sought immortality through the stories, binding his soul to the book and thus to the archives ensuring his endless resurrection through the fears of others. As the storm outside reached its crescendo, the distinction between the archives and the world of the book dissolved entirely. The building itself seemed to be alive, its architecture pulsating with the same malevolent energy as the book. Corridors stretched and contracted like the chambers of a giant heart. Doors vanished only to reappear elsewhere, and the darkness felt thick and 
alive, swallowing sound and hope alike. Elise realized that to escape, she might need to confront the book's creator, the mad archivist, whose spirit was anchored to the physical realm by the book itself. To find him, she would have to delve deeper into the archives, beyond the known layers of reality, into the core of the nightmare that the place had become. Her journey took her through scenes of horror that defied the natural order, places where the rules of physics and sanity no longer applied, and where each step forward could be a plunge into an abyss of madness. The tales from the book played out in grotesque tableau around her, each more horrifying than the last, as if the building itself was attempting to terrify her into submission. But Elise pressed on, driven by a desperate need to end the cycle of fear and release the souls trapped within the archives. Her path led her ever downward into the bowels of the building where the light of reality grew dim and the darkness teemed with the unspoken horrors of a thousand untold stories waiting for her at the heart of the Rue Morgue. Descending deeper into the bowels of the Rue Morgue, Elise felt the oppressive weight of the untold stories bearing down on her, their whispers now deafening screams in the claustrophobic darkness. Each step forward seemed to lead her further into a realm where reality and fiction merged into a nightmarish tableau. The very fabric of the archives infused with the essence of the book's horrors. In this nether region, the laws of time and space unraveled, corridors spiraled into infinity, and rooms looped back upon themselves in impossible geometry. Elise encountered scenes of horror that were not just retellings from the book, but living memories replaying their terror in a perpetual loop. It was as if the archives had become a living entity, its consciousness woven from the countless fears harvested by the book. As she navigated this labyrinth, Elise's sense of self began to fray, her memories bleeding into the stories around her, blurring the line between her identity and the characters from the tales. She saw reflections of herself in every twisted narrative, as if the book was rewriting her existence into its pages. Eventually, Elise reached what seemed to be the core of the archives, a vast, cavernous library where the shelves towered into the darkness, their contents glowing with an eldritch light. Here, the air pulsed with the power of the book, and floating amidst the shelves were the specters of those who had been consumed by its stories, their faces eternally contorted in expressions of fear and awe. In the center of this chamber stood a dais, upon which the book lay open, its pages fluttering as if caught in an unfelt breeze. Surrounding the dais, were chains of light that spiraled upward into the darkness, anchoring the book to the very heart of the archives. It was clear that this book was the source, the nexus of all the horror and madness that filled the Rue Morgue. Elise approached the dais, each step resonating with the accumulated terror of the ages. She could feel the gaze of the mad archivist upon her. His presence suffused throughout the archives, watching her through the eyes of every twisted narrative and spectral figure. His voice, a sibilant whisper, filled the chamber, tempting Elise to join the narrative, 
to become a part of the archive's eternal story. As she stood before the book, Elise realized that the stories were not just being told. They were being relived. Their characters trapped in a perpetual cycle of fear and death to confront the mad archivist and end the cycle. She would need to enter the narrative herself to become a character in the very stories she sought to escape. With a trembling hand, Elise reached out to the book, her fingers brushing against its pages. The stories surged forward, enveloping her in a maelstrom of memories and nightmares, each one clamoring to claim her as its protagonist. The chamber around her began to dissolve, the shelves and specters fading into a blur of light and shadow. Elise found herself standing in the midst of a story yet untold, a narrative forged from the deepest fears of the human psyche, a tale that could only exist in the liminal space between the pages of the Rue Morgue's cursed tome. Here, in this story within a story, Elise would need to confront the essence of fear itself, to navigate a plot that twisted and turned with the capricious nature of a dream. As the narrative unfolded around her, the boundaries between Elise and the character she had become blurred. Her memories and emotions fueling the events of the tale. She was no longer just a reader or a victim of the archives. She was now an integral part of its legacy. Her fate intertwined with the very fabric of the Rue Morgue's dark history. And as the story continued to weave itself around her, Elise realized that to break the cycle, truly free herself and the others ensnared by the book. She would need to reach the climax of this tale, to face the horror at its heart, and rewrite the ending that the mad archivist had never foreseen, but what that ending might be, and whether it would bring salvation or damnation, remained to be seen. Hidden in the shadowy depths of the Rue Morgue's twisted narratives. In the heart of the narrative maelstrom, Elise, now fully integrated into the fabric of the Rue Morgue's haunted tale, navigated the labyrinthine plot that was both her prison and her only path to salvation. The environment around her shifted with each step, scenes morphing to reflect the darkest corners of her mind and the fears of those ensnared before her. She found herself in a twisted version of the archives, where the specters of past readers roamed as lost authors of their unfinished stories, their whispers a cacophony of unfinished endings and untold horrors. These ghostly figures, trapped between the lines of their tales, reached out to Elise begging her to complete their narratives and release them from their eternal bondage. As Elise moved through this surreal landscape, she realized that each area of the archives represented a chapter of the book. And to reach the mad archivist, she would need to traverse the entire story, from prologue to an unknown finale. Each chapter unraveled a piece of the archivist's own story, revealing how he had sacrificed his humanity for a twisted form of immortality within the book's pages. The deeper Elise delved, the more the boundaries of her identity were tested. She encountered reflections of herself in the stories as the heroine, the victim, the antagonist each role a facet of her being, manipulated and rewritten by the archivist to suit his narrative design. 
The line between who Elise was and who the book wanted her to be became increasingly blurred. Her memories and reality intermingling until they were indistinguishable. In one harrowing chapter, Elise faced her own deepest fears, materialized into a grotesque creature, a personification of the terror that the book fed upon. This confrontation forced her to confront her past, reliving the moments of her life that had led her to the archives, and to realize that her journey into the Rue Morgue was no accident. It was orchestrated by the mad archivist, who saw in her the potential to become the ultimate protagonist of his creation, fighting through scenes of psychological horror and physical torment. Elise gradually pieced together the archivist's true intent. He sought to break free from the confines of the book and enter the real world, using Elise as the conduit for his escape. Each story, each fear absorbed, brought him closer to achieving a physical form, culminating in a final narrative that would bridge the gap between fiction and reality. As Elise approached the climax of the book's twisted narrative, she encountered other characters who had become self-aware, remnants of the archivist's psyche, each representing a part of his madness and genius. They were the guardians of the story, tasked with ensuring its completion according to the archivist's vision. But Elise, armed with the knowledge of her own role in the archivist's plan, began to rewrite her story from within, altering the narrative fabric of the book. With each change, the archives shuddered, its physical and metaphysical structure strained under the weight of her defiance. The final chapter loomed ahead, a gateway between the world of the Rue Morgue and reality, where Elise would either become the key to the archivist's liberation or the architect of his ultimate downfall. As the boundary between the book's world and the real world began to thin, Elise prepared to confront the archivist in a final showdown, not just for her own soul, but for the essence of every story ever told within the cursed pages of the Rue Morgue. And so, with the lines of the story drawing ever tighter around her, Elise advanced towards her destiny, ready to face the archivist in a battle that would define the boundary between story and reality, nightmare and waking life in the ever-shifting halls of the Rue Morgue. As Elise stepped into the final chapter, the world around her quaked under the strain of her rebellion against the narrative. The archives, now more a creature of living stories than a place, convulsed with the battle between her will and the mad archivist's design. Walls pulsed like the pages of a rapid heartbeat, each throb a clash of her intent against the predetermined script of the book. In this ultimate chapter, the environment was a surreal amalgamation of all the previous stories, a chaotic realm where logic and madness danced in a macabre ballet. Elise navigated through this shifting landscape, her every action rewriting the lines of the world around her, defying the archivist's narrative. The mad archivist, sensing his control slipping, manifested as a chameleon-like entity, constantly shifting through the forms of all the characters Elise had encountered within the book. He was a shadowy marionettist, pulling at the strings of reality, trying to entrap Elise in a climax of his creation, one that would seal his escape into the real world. 
Elise's journey through the final chapter was a harrowing gauntlet of psychological and existential challenges. She encountered scenes where her deepest doubts and fears were weaponized, turned into narrative obstacles designed to break her spirit and force her into the role the archivist had written for her. But with each step forward, Elise reclaimed parts of her identity, rewriting her character to be stronger, more resilient, and defiant of the fate scripted for her. As she progressed, the nature of the archives shifted more erratically, the stories becoming more desperate and intense. The air was thick with the screams of the narrative's previous victims, now cheering for Elise's defiance, lending her their strength and hopes for a new ending. In a climactic confrontation, Elise faced the archivist in a realm that defied the physical dimensions of the archives, a space where the collected fears and stories formed a tempestuous sea of energy. Here, the archivist revealed his true form, a grotesque amalgamation of every story, every character, and every fear he had absorbed, a living testament to the power and horror of the book. The battle between Elise and the archivist was more than physical. It was a duel of narratives, a struggle between her will to redefine her story and the archivist's desire to maintain his dominion over the tale. With each clash, the boundary between the story world and the real world thinned, creating fractures in the fabric of reality through which the raw essence of the Rue Morgue bled into the world. Elise, drawing upon the collective strength and desperation of the souls trapped within the archives, channeled their desire for release into her defiance, reshaping the narrative around her. She became a living embodiment of the story, powerful enough to confront the archivist on equal footing, her actions rewriting not just her fate, but the fate of the Rue Morgue itself. As the confrontation reached its zenith, the very essence of the archives began to unravel, the stories disentangling from the fabric of the building, freeing the trapped souls and dissolving the boundaries of the mad archivist's realm. The Rue Morgue, long a prison of horror and despair, started to crumble its foundation shaken by the impending collapse of the narrative that had sustained it. In this moment of chaos and potential liberation, Elise stood at the precipice of a new reality, one where the outcome of her struggle could either mean the end of the Rue Morgue's curse or the beginning of a new, even more terrifying chapter in the book's existence. The battle between Elise and the archivist, now intertwined with the fate of the archives itself, was set to define the future of every soul touched by the Rue Morgue's dark legacy. In the crumbling realm of the Rue Morgue, the final showdown between Elise and the mad archivist tore through the fabric of the narrative, sending shockwaves across the boundary between fiction and reality. The archives, once a bastion of controlled horror, now buckled under the force of their confrontation, its structure fracturing as the stories that formed its foundation were rewritten or destroyed. As Elise battled the archivist, the air around them was thick with the essence of untold tales, swirling in a maelstrom of potential realities. Each blow exchanged between them reshaped the world, crafting and dissolving futures with the weight of their wills. The archivist, desperate 
to maintain his existence, shifted through forms and narratives, each more terrifying and persuasive than the last, trying to ensnare Elise in a story that would seal her fate and ensure his escape. Elise, empowered by the collective will of the souls within the archives, fought not just for her freedom, but for the liberation of all who had been consumed by the book's narrative. Her resolve turned her into a beacon of rebellion within the story. Her actions rewriting the laws of the narrative realm, challenging the very notion of predestined plots. The battle escalated, tearing through the layers of the archives, from the deepest, darkest shelves of forgotten lore to the surface, where the storm that had begun with Elise's journey now raged in full fury, mirroring the chaos inside. Reality itself seemed to pause, holding its breath as the conflict reached its peak. In this climax, the archivist unveiled his masterstroke, a narrative trap that would rewrite Elise's entire existence, making her an eternal part of the archives, a final twist that would bind her to the book forever. He conjured illusions of Elise's past, twisting her memories and fears into a web of despair, attempting to break her will. But Elise, understanding now that her power lay in her ability to defy and rewrite her story, resisted. She embraced the fluidity of the narrative, using her imagination and the fragmented tales around her to craft weapons of defiance. Each strike against the archivist, a line in her new story. One where she was not a victim, but the author of her fate. The confrontation reached a fever pitch. The boundaries between the story world and the real world, now almost non-existent. The storm outside the archives and the tumult within merged, creating a vortex at the heart of which stood Elise and the archivist. Locked in a moment, where every possible ending hung in the balance, each waiting to be written. As the structure of the Rue Morgue strained and buckled, threatening to collapse and release the raw power of the narrative into the world, Elise and the archivist became the focal point of a narrative singularity, a place where the story could be ended or reborn in infinite variations. In this nexus, with the fate of the archives and its countless souls in her hands, Elise faced a choice that transcended her own survival. She stood at the threshold of creation and destruction, where her decision would either close the book on the Rue Morgue's dark legacy or open a new chapter of untold horrors. And as the storm outside reached its zenith, mirroring the intensity of their battle, the line between Elise's story and the story of the Rue Morgue blurred into a single climactic moment of decision, setting the stage for a resolution that would reshape the very essence of reality and fiction, leaving the door open for the narrative to continue its haunting journey. In the crumbling realm of the Rue Morgue, the final showdown between Elise and the mad archivist tore through the fabric of the narrative, sending shockwaves across the boundary between fiction and reality. The archives, once a bastion of controlled horror, now buckled under the force of their confrontation, its structure fracturing as the stories that formed its foundation were rewritten or destroyed. As Elise battled the archivist, the air around them was thick 
with the essence of untold tales, swirling in a maelstrom of potential realities, each blow exchanged between them reshaped the world, crafting and dissolving futures with the weight of their wills. The archivist, desperate to maintain his existence, shifted through forms and narratives, each more terrifying and persuasive than the last, trying to ensnare Elise in a story that would seal her fate and ensure his escape. Elise, empowered by the collective will of the souls within the archives, fought not just for her freedom, but for the liberation of all who had been consumed by the book's narrative. Her resolve turned her into a beacon of rebellion within the story, her actions rewriting the laws of the narrative realm, challenging the very notion of predestined plots. The battle escalated, tearing through the layers of the archives, from the deepest, darkest shelves of forgotten lore to the surface, where the storm that had begun with Elise's journey now raged in full fury, mirroring the chaos inside. Reality itself seemed to pause, holding its breath as the conflict reached its peak. In this climax, the archivist unveiled his masterstroke, a narrative trap that would rewrite Elise's entire existence, making her an eternal part of the archives, a final twist that would bind her to the book forever. He conjured illusions of Elise's past, twisting her memories and fears into a web of despair, attempting to break her will. But Elise, understanding now that her power lay in her ability to defy and rewrite her story, resisted. She embraced the fluidity of the narrative, using her imagination and the fragmented tales around her to craft weapons of defiance. Each strike against the archivist a line in her new story, one where she was not a victim, but the author of her fate. The confrontation reached a fever pitch, the boundaries between the story world and the real world now almost non-existent. The storm outside the archives and the tumult within merged, creating a vortex at the heart of which stood Elise and the archivist, locked in a moment where every possible ending hung in the balance, each waiting to be written. As the structure of the Rue Morgue strained and buckled, threatening to collapse and release the raw power of the narrative into the world, Elise and the archivist became the focal point of a narrative singularity a place where the story could be ended or reborn in infinite variations. In this nexus, with the fate of the archives and its countless souls in her hands, Elise faced a choice that transcended her own survival. She stood at the threshold of creation and destruction, where her decision would either close the book on the Rue Morgue's dark legacy or open a new chapter of untold horrors. And as the storm outside reached its zenith, mirroring the intensity of their battle, the line between Elise's story and the story of the Rue Morgue blurred into a single climactic moment of decision, setting the stage for a resolution that would reshape the very essence of reality and fiction leaving the door open for the narrative to continue its haunting journey. As the storm outside melded with the chaos within, Elise, standing at the heart of the Rue Morgue, faced the archivist in a final, decisive confrontation. The archives around them trembled, the air thick 
with the power of unmade stories and the echoes of a thousand lost souls. In this climactic moment, the archivist, his form a shifting maelstrom of narrative fragments, unleashed his full fury upon Elise, attempting to subsume her will into the book's ending. But Elise, her resolve as strong as the stories were desperate, fought back with the power of her own rewritten narrative. Her every action, an assertion of her identity and determination to end the cycle of horror. The battle between them transcended physical limits, becoming a struggle of wills, where each strike rewrote the fabric of the archive's reality. Elise, drawing upon the collective strength and hopes of the souls trapped within the pages, challenged the archivist's dominion with every word and deed. Her defiance, rewriting the cursed book's narrative. As the conflict reached its zenith, Elise realized that the key to defeating the archivist lay in accepting her role not just as a protagonist within the story, but as its author. With this revelation, she seized control of the narrative, bending the story to her will. She crafted a new ending, one where the archivist's power was not just contained, but undone. Channeling her will through the book, Elise rewrote the archivist's fate, turning his own narrative against him. She bound him within his own tales, a prisoner of the stories he had manipulated for so long. As she did so, the chains of light that tethered the book to the archives shattered, releasing the pent-up energy of the untold stories. The release of this energy set off a chain reaction, freeing the trapped souls and dissolving the fabric of the Rue Morgue's narrative realm. The building, long a sentinel over the dark tales within, groaned and shuddered as it began to collapse. Its existence tied to the fate of the book and its creator. In a final act of defiance, Elise threw the book into the heart of the collapsing archive the tome igniting in a blaze of eldritch fire as it met its end. The archivist's screams echoed through the crumbling halls, his existence forever bound to the book, now burning away into ashes and oblivion. As the Rue Morgue crumbled, Elise ran, escaping the destruction with moments to spare. She emerged into the storm, the archives nothing more than rubble behind her. The cursed book and its horrors finally laid to rest. In the aftermath, the world was left with the remnants of the Rue Morgue, a cautionary tale of the power of stories and the dangers of allowing them to consume us. Elise, forever changed, carried with her the knowledge and the scars of her ordeal a living testament to the thin line between reality and the tales we tell. The storm passed, leaving a clear sky and a sense of peace that had long been absent from the place where the Rue Morgue once stood. And though the book was destroyed, the stories, freed from their prison, lived on, whispered in the winds, a reminder of the power of narratives and the need to respect the boundaries between creation and creator. In the end, the legacy of the Rue Morgue and its mad archivist lived on, not as a source of fear, but as a cautionary tale about the depths of the human psyche and the eternal haunting power of stories.
In the heart of Tokyo, a rumor circulated about a midnight train that appeared only once a year on the night of Oban, when the veil between the living and the dead was thinnest. They called it the Yurei Densha, the ghost train, a phantom service that carried souls to the afterlife. And it was said that anyone who boarded it would be trapped forever, unable to escape the restless spirits that roamed its carriages. Determined to debunk the myth, a group of thrill-seekers, including myself, gathered at the rumored station as the clock neared midnight. The air was thick with anticipation and a chilling mist that seemed to rise from nowhere. As the traditional time for spirits to wander the earth approached, a distant whistle pierced the night, and the outline of an old, dilapidated train emerged from the fog, stopping with a screech at the platform. Despite our apprehension, curiosity won over fear, and we boarded the train. The doors shut with an ominous thud, and as the train lurched forward, the station disappeared into the mist, as if swallowed by the night. Inside, the carriages were dimly lit, the only illumination coming from flickering lights that cast ghostly shadows. The seats were empty, save for a few figures cloaked in darkness, their faces obscured, silent, and unmoving. As the train plunged into a tunnel, the atmosphere shifted. The sound of the wheels grinding against the tracks was drowned out by whispers in a language that was neither Japanese nor any known dialect. The temperature dropped, breath turning to mist, and the figures in the shadows began to stir, their movements jerky and unnatural. Ignoring the growing sense of dread, we explored the train each carriage revealing a new horror. One was filled with traditional Japanese dolls, their eyes following our every move. Another was a banquet hall with a feast laid out, the food rotten and crawling with insects, yet set as if waiting for guests to partake in the macabre meal. We realized too late that the train was not bound for a physical destination was traversing the boundaries of our world and the next. Each carriage was a realm of nightmares, a piece of a puzzle that hinted at a terrifying reality. The train was a purgatory for lost souls, and we were its newest passengers. The further we traveled, the more the line between the living and the dead blurred. Phantoms of past passengers appeared, reenacting their final moments, trapped in an endless loop of their demise. The scenes became increasingly personal, revealing fears and secrets we had never shared. As if the train itself was peeling away our defenses, exposing the darkest corners of our souls. In the last carriage, the true nature of the train was revealed. It was a colossal, sentient entity, feeding on the fears and spirits of its passengers, growing stronger with each journey. The cloaked figures were its minions, herding the souls it collected, preparing them for the journey to the afterlife. Or worse, assimilation into the train's ghastly existence. As the realization dawned, the train's interior transformed into a nightmarish landscape, a fusion of our fears and the train's malevolent energy, the exits sealed by unseen forces, windows revealing only the swirling mists of the spirit world. We found ourselves trapped, racing towards an unknown fate, our screams drowned out by the whistle of the Yuri Densha echoing through the darkness of a realm where night never
never ended. Trapped on the Ure Densha, we struggled against the growing tide of despair. The train, a living entity, seemed to delight in our panic, its corridors elongating and contorting, creating an ever-changing maze of horror. Each compartment we passed through was a domain of dread, designed to break our spirit and claim our souls. In one carriage, we encountered the spirits of those who had tried to challenge the train's curse in the past. Their ghostly forms were eternally repeating their failed attempts to escape, their faces twisted in expressions of eternal terror and regret. From them, we learned that the train had been cursed centuries ago, a vengeful act by a powerful spirit wronged by mortals, turning it into a vessel of torment and retribution. As the train hurtled through the spectral landscape, outside the windows, we saw glimpses of other realms, nightmarish visions of worlds beyond our comprehension. Each view a fleeting glimpse into the infinite possibilities of the afterlife, some terrifying, others tragically beautiful. We realized that to escape, we needed to understand the rules of this supernatural realm. Each carriage seemed to operate under its own set of twisted logic, a puzzle that, if solved, would reveal the path to the next. We had to navigate through these puzzles, facing our deepest fears and darkest memories, which the train conjured into vivid, horrifying reality. Our journey took us through a carriage filled with mirrors, each reflecting not our own image, but scenes from our past, twisted and darkened to instill fear. Another carriage was a forest of whispering trees, their leaves inscribed with the names of lost souls, the ground covered in a mist that whispered of forgotten lives and untold stories. Despite the terror and confusion, we began to notice a pattern in the madness. The train, in its own twisted way, was guiding us, testing us. It was a crucible for the souls it carried a trial to determine their final resting place. The spirits we encountered, once passengers like us, had failed this test. Their eternal fate to ride the train through the darkness. Our resolve hardened. We pressed on, determined not to succumb to the same fate. With each carriage we conquered, the malevolent intelligence of the train seemed to grow more focused its efforts to break us more desperate and personal. It created illusions of our loved ones, scenes of agony and betrayal, trying to weaken our resolve through guilt and sorrow. But with each passing trial, we grew stronger, more aware of the train's machinations, and more adept at deciphering the twisted logic of its realms. Our progress did not go unnoticed, the cloaked figures, once content to watch from the shadows, now actively sought to hinder us, their forms shifting and changing, becoming more monstrous and terrifying, embodiments of the train's dark will. As we neared what we hoped was the final carriage, the very essence of the train seemed to shift into a state of alert its entire being focused on stopping our advance. The corridor leading to the last compartment stretched before us, an endless path lined with the tormented faces of souls lost to the train's hunger, their silent screams a dire warning of the potential fate awaiting us if we failed. And at the end of this gauntlet, the door to the final carriage awaited, an ominous portal glowing with an otherworldly light, promising the end of our journey or the beginning of an eternal nightmare. The air thrilled.
drummed with power. The train's will pressing down on us like a physical weight. Its desire to claim our spirits for its own, a palpable force, driving against our steps towards the looming threshold. As we approached the final carriage, the atmosphere grew increasingly oppressive. The air thick with the train's malevolence and the collective dread of its trapped souls. The door to the carriage was adorned with intricate carvings that seemed to shift and writhe under our gaze, depicting scenes of the train's dark history and the countless lives it had consumed. With each step, the whispers of the past grew louder, a cacophony of voices begging for release or screaming in torment. Each one a remnant of a soul absorbed by the Yuri Densha. The door itself appeared to pulsate, as if breathing, its surface cold and slick like the skin of some vast, slumbering creature. Bracing ourselves, we pushed open the door, and the interior of the final carriage was revealed. Unlike the others, this one was starkly empty. A vast, open space that stretched far beyond the physical confines of the train. The walls, ceiling, and floor were made of a swirling, nebulous mist in which faces and forms appeared and vanished with tortured expressions. The essence of the train's collected souls at the center of this ethereal expanse stood the heart of the Yure Densha, a massive, pulsating, organ-like structure from which all the train's corridors and compartments seemed to emanate. Veins of light stretched from it in all directions, pulsing with a sickly glow, feeding the train's never-ending journey through the shadow realms. The entity at the core of the train, a being of pure malice and sorrow, materialized before us, its form a constantly changing mass of faces and limbs, each one a twisted memory of the souls it had devoured. It spoke in a chorus of voices, each syllable dripping with the pain and suffering it had inflicted over centuries. Its words, a tapestry of the darkest emotions. Facing this embodiment of the train's essence, we understood the true challenge. To free ourselves and the trapped spirits, we needed to sever the connection between the entity and the Yure Densha. The pulsating heart, the nexus of its power, was the key. The entity, sensing our intent, unleashed its fury, shaping the mist into nightmarish forms, each more terrifying than the last, in a desperate bid to protect itself and continue its eternal journey of torment. The battle that ensued was not just physical, but a clash of wills. As we fought to overcome the fear and despair the train fed upon, with each attack we evaded or countered, we drew closer to the heart, our resolve strengthening with the knowledge that the fate of countless souls rested on our actions. As we navigated the treacherous landscape of the final carriage, our every belief and fear was tested. The entity taunted us with visions of our darkest moments and greatest fears, attempting to break our spirits and add us to its collection of tormented souls. But with each challenge, we grew more determined. Our purpose clear, and our hearts fortified against the darkness. In this surreal arena, where the boundaries of reality were bent and twisted by the will of the Yuri Densha, we prepared for the final confrontation. With the heart of the train in sight, its pulsing glow 
a beacon of the suffering it had caused. We rallied for a decisive strike, not just to end our nightmare, but to bring release to the souls ensnared by the train's curse. Their whispers, now a unified chorus, urging us on. Their hopes and fears lending us strength for the impending battle against the dark heart of the Eurydentia. The entity, aware of our nearing triumph, intensified its assault, shaping the mists into grotesque manifestations of its power. These phantasmal creatures, each a distorted reflection of the train's devoured souls, surged towards us in waves, their forms as malleable and unpredictable as the mist from which they were born. Amidst this chaos, we battled our way towards the heart, the entity's attacks becoming more desperate and frenzied. It was as if the Yure Densha itself was aware of its impending doom, the very fabric of the carriage warping and distorting, trying to disorient and separate us. The air was filled with the screams and pleas of the trapped souls, their voices merging into a cacophony that seemed to fuel the train's fury. As we neared the pulsating heart, the entity took on a more defined form, becoming a towering figure of darkness, its eyes burning with a malevolent light. It spoke in a voice that reverberated through the carriage, a sound that was both everywhere and nowhere, promising eternal torment and despair. In this nightmarish realm, the laws of physics and reality were mere suggestions, and the entity used this to its advantage, altering the environment to hinder our progress. The ground beneath our feet undulated like the surface of a stormy sea, and the walls closed in, trying to crush us with the weight of the train's dark history. Despite the odds, we persevered, our resolve hardened by the suffering we had witnessed and the spirits we had vowed to free. With each step, we disrupted the entity's control, the heart's pulsing rhythm faltering under our onslaught, the spirits of the train Sensing the shift in power, began to rally, their forms coalescing into beams of light that struck at the entity, weakening it further and illuminating our path. The final stretch to the heart was the most harrowing, the entity unleashing its full might, manifesting our deepest fears and regrets into physical form attempting to break our will, but driven by a purpose greater than our own survival. We fought through the illusions, tearing through the layers of fear and manipulation that the entity had woven around its heart. As we stood before the heart of the Yure Densha, its surface writhing like a living thing, we prepared to deliver the final blow. The entity now a maelstrom of darkness and malice loomed over us, its form a towering inferno of spectral energy, threatening to consume everything in its path. The clash that followed was a tempest of light and darkness. Each blow we struck against the heart, echoing through the train like the tolling of a bell signaling the end of the entity's reign of terror. With each hit, cracks appeared in the heart, the light of trapped souls shining through, their voices now clear and resolute, chanting in unison for freedom and release. The entity, weakened and desperate, fought back with dwindling strength its form flickering and fragmenting, unable to maintain its presence in the face of our compassion.
combined assault. The carriage around us began to crumble, the reality of the train unraveling as the heart's hold on the spectral realm weakened. In this climactic battle, where the fate of the Yure Densha hung in the balance, we stood united, our actions a beacon of hope for the countless souls ensnared by the train's curse, each strike bringing us closer to shattering the heart and ending the nightmare journey of the ghost train once and for all. With every strike against the heart of the Yure Densha, the entity's form wavered, its essence bleeding into the mist, weakening its grip on the realm. The train carriages shook violently, the very structure of the Yure Densha convulsing as if in agony, the entity's control slipping away. The spectral realm around us began to fracture, glimpses of the real world seeping through the cracks. The early morning light of a world still oblivious to the horrors that transpired on the ghostly train, the once impenetrable boundaries between the realms were eroding, the entity's weakening power unable to maintain the separation. In a desperate bid to preserve itself, the entity unleashed its remaining energy in a devastating wave, attempting to obliterate us and extinguish the rebellion of the souls it had consumed. The air was filled with a thunderous roar, a sound that was both a scream of rage and a wail of despair, resonating through the collapsing carriages. We stood our ground, fueled by a determination that was more than our own. The spirits of the train lending us their strength and courage Together, we forged a shield of resolve and defiance, pushing back against the entity's assault. Each of us a conduit for the collective power of the lost souls yearning for release. The heart of the Yuri Densha, now exposed and vulnerable, pulsed erratically, its rhythm out of sync cracks in its surface glowing with an intense light. The essence of trapped souls seeking escape. We closed in. Our attacks synchronized with the chants of the spirits. Each hit a blow for freedom. Each step forward, a march toward victory. The entity, its form fragmenting, lashed out in blind fury its attacks more erratic, but no less deadly. The remnants of its power manifesting as physical and spectral threats. A last ditch effort to survive and continue its cycle of torment. The carriages of the train were now disintegrating. The reality of the ghost train unraveling. The illusion of its invincibility shattered by our relentless advance. As we neared the heart, the entity, in a final act of defiance, condensed its essence into a singular, devastating form, a dark mirror of the train itself, a phantom locomotive of pure malice, its whistle a death knell echoing through the collapsing realm. It charged at us, the very embodiment of the Yuri Densha's centuries of sorrow and pain, a last stand against the inevitable tide of change we represented. The collision of our forces was a cataclysm, a clash of wills and power that shook the foundations of the spectral world, a battle cry of the living and the dead against a tyranny that had spanned generations. As we fought, the heart of the train, the nexus of the entity's power, began to crumble, its destruction imminent, the liberation of countless souls within reach. In this moment, where past and present, life and death, 
horror, and hope intersected. We stood at the heart of the Yure Densha. Our fate intertwined with the spirits we sought to free. Our actions the fulcrum upon which the legacy of the ghost train would pivot. The final chapter of its haunted journey hanging in the balance. Awaiting the decisive blow that would either end the nightmare or herald the dawn of a new terror. The spectral locomotive, a manifestation of the Yure Densha's last vestiges of power, bore down on us with terrifying speed. Its form a blur of darkness and malevolent energy, the air screamed as it cleaved through the mist. The very essence of the train's accumulated rage and despair focused into this final, desperate attack. Around us, the remnants of the train's interior were coming apart. The boundaries between the spectral and physical worlds fraying to the point of non-existence. The souls of the departed, once trapped within the train's confines, swirled around us in a vortex of light and shadow, their presence bolstering our resolve their whispers a chorus of encouragement and desperation. As the phantom locomotive approached, we braced for impact, channeling every ounce of our collective will and the energy lent by the liberated souls into a counter-strike. Our defiance met the oncoming darkness head-on, a collision of forces that resonated through the collapsing train and into the realms beyond. The impact was cataclysmic, a maelstrom of psychic and spiritual energy that tore through the remnants of the Yure Densha, the heart of the train. Already fissured and weakened by our assault, shattered under the strain, releasing a blinding explosion of light that consumed the ghostly locomotive its destruction, a silent, implosive scream that echoed through the dying realm. In the aftermath, the world of the Yuri Densha became a void, a silent expanse where the remnants of the train's existence faded like the last echoes of a nightmare. The once oppressive atmosphere of dread and despair was gone replaced by a tranquil nothingness, a space between worlds where the rules of reality were yet to be rewritten. Floating in this void, we were neither wholly in the physical world nor fully detached from the spectral realm. Suspended in a moment of transition, the souls of the departed, now freed from the entity's grasp, began to ascend, their forms dissolving into streams of light that climbed toward an unseen celestial destination. Among these liberated spirits, the presence of the train's original architect, the source of the curse, lingered, freed from the darkness that had consumed it. The spirit appeared before us. Its form no longer twisted by malice, but rather suffused with a sorrowful peace. It conveyed a silent gratitude and regret, acknowledging the wrongs of its past and the suffering it had caused, before joining the procession of souls moving towards their final rest. As the last of the spirits departed, the void began to brighten fabric of reality knitting itself back together, guided by the natural order of the universe now restored. We found ourselves standing on the platform of a mundane train station, the first rays of dawn casting long shadows across the ground, the night's horrors fading like mist at sunrise. But even as the world returned to normal, a sense of unease lingered, 
a reminder of the thin veil between life and death, and the eternal journey of souls caught in the cycle of grief and redemption. The Eurydentia was gone, its existence erased from the physical world. Yet the memory of our journey, the terror and triumph, remained indelibly etched in our minds. A haunting echo of the night we escaped the Japanese horror train challenge. As we stood on the deserted platform, the world around us bathed in the early light of dawn. The surreal tranquility of the moment belied the intensity of the night's ordeal. The train station, mundane and silent, held no trace of the Yuri Dench's passage, yet the air still hummed with a residual energy, a whisper of the boundary we had crossed between life and death. Our group, bound by the shared experience of the night's horrors, exchanged glances, each of us searching for reassurance in the other's eyes that what we had endured was real not just the remnants of a collective nightmare. The physical scars were absent, but the emotional and psychological marks ran deep, shaping our perception of reality and the unseen worlds beyond. In the silence, a subtle disturbance rippled through the air, a barely perceptible vibration, like the aftershock of a distant quake. It was a reminder that though the Yurei Densha had been vanquished, the forces it had harnessed, the dark energies of grief and malice, were eternal, merely dispersed for now, waiting to coalesce around a new focal point. As the day broke, we began to notice anomalies in the world around us, small incongruities that suggested our ordeal had altered our connection to the ordinary. Shadows seemed to linger longer than they should, and reflections in windows and mirrors hesitated before mimicking our movements, as if the boundary between the reflected world and our own had been loosened. Discussing our experiences, we realized that each of us had brought back a piece of the spectral realm, an intangible, yet undeniable change in our being. It was as if, in breaking the curse of the Yurei Densha, we had also unraveled a thread in the fabric of reality, creating a slight but perceptible shift in the way we interacted with the world. The public began to populate the station, their lives untouched by the nocturnal events that had reshaped our existence. To them, we were merely early travelers, perhaps a little worse for wear, oblivious to the fact that we stood at the crossroads of worlds, witnesses to the hidden depths of reality, compelled by a need to understand the extent of the change within us, we decided to explore our altered perceptions. Our journey through the Yure Densha had ended, but it had set us on a new path, one that promised further encounters with the supernatural and a deeper dive into the mysteries of the spirit world. As we left the station, the city awakening around us, we felt the pull of unseen threads guiding us towards new mysteries and challenges. The spectral world once hidden behind a veil of disbelief, now beckoned with a siren call, promising answers and further enigmas. Our experience on the Yurei Densha had opened a door, revealing a path lined with shadow and light, where ancient spirits wandered and tales of the paranormal waited to be uncovered. The train's final legacy was not just the liberation of its trapped souls, but the awakening of our own to the endless possibilities of 
the unknown. And so, with the city stretching out before us, we stepped into the daylight, carrying the night's shadows with us, ready to face the new world we had uncovered, a world where the ghost train's whistle still echoed, a haunting reminder of the journey between the veils of life and death. We arrived at the Airbnb late at night, after hours of driving through twisting back roads that seemed to loop back on themselves. The old house stood isolated at the end of a gravel path, its windows dark, the facade overtaken by creeping ivy. It had the charm of a forgotten era, with its Victorian architecture and an air of neglect that suggested a rich history. Upon entering, we were greeted by an unnerving silence, the kind that amplifies every creak and whisper of the wind. The interior was adorned with antique furniture, portraits of stern-faced individuals, and ornate mirrors that seemed too ornamental for a rental. It was quaint, yet something felt off like we were stepping into a space that was frozen in time, resentful of our intrusion. The first night passed uneasily. The house groaned and settled, and we joked about it having character. But as the days unfolded, our laughter subsided, replaced by a growing sense of unease. Doors would close on their own. And at night, the sound of footsteps echoed in the halls, always stopping just outside our bedroom door. We tried to rationalize these occurrences, attributing them to the house's age and our own overactive imaginations. But then, things escalated. Personal items began to move or disappear entirely, only to reappear in places we had never visited. One morning, we found a set of muddy footprints inside the front door, leading to the basement. Yet the door remained locked, and the keys hadn't moved from where we left them. Determined to uncover an explanation, we ventured into the basement on the third night. The air grew colder as we descended, the light from our phones casting deep shadows across the stone walls. At the bottom, we found an old study, filled with dusty books, ancient artifacts, and a large, intricately carved mirror that dominated the room. Drawn to the mirror, we noticed that it didn't reflect the room, but instead displayed a dark, distorted version of it, with shadowy figures moving in the periphery. As we watched, transfixed, the figures seemed to notice us, turning their featureless faces in our direction. We backed away, but the door to the basement had shut, trapping us inside. The figures in the mirror began to press against the glass, as if trying to break through into our world. In a panic, we turned to find another way out, only to be confronted by the sight of the room changing, twisting into a nightmarish version of itself, the walls pulsing with a life of their own. And that's when we heard it, a low, haunting melody filtering through the air, its source unseen, but felt throughout the chilling atmosphere of the basement. The melody warped and twisted, a sinister lullaby that seemed to beckon us deeper into the darkness of the house's hidden heart. The melody's sinister allure drew us deeper into the basement's labyrinthine heart, where the air was thick with the musty scent of decay. The once solid stone walls now appeared porous and shifting. 
as if breathing in rhythm with the haunting tune, our surroundings became increasingly surreal. The line between the physical and the ethereal blurring as the melody wove through our senses, disorienting and guiding us simultaneously. We stumbled upon a room that seemed out of place, an immaculately preserved parlor filled with Victorian era furnishings, all centered around a grand piano, its keys moving of their own accord, playing the haunting melody. The room was lit by a flickering chandelier, casting shadows that danced and twisted around us, their movements unnervingly human. Compelled by a mixture of fear and fascination, we approached the piano, noting that its music sheets were blank, yet it played a complex, melancholic piece that tugged at the darkest recesses of our minds. As we stood there, entranced, the air shimmered, and the ghostly apparition of a woman appeared, her hands moving over the piano keys without touching them. Her expression was one of deep sorrow and longing, and though she seemed not to notice us, her presence filled the room with a palpable sense of grief. Attempting to break the spell, we explored the rest of the parlor, finding letters and photographs that told of a tragic past, of a family torn apart by loss and a mysterious pact made in desperation. The more we uncovered, the more the house seemed to respond, the walls whispering secrets and the shadows growing more agitated. As we delved into the family's history, the ghostly woman's image began to appear in mirrors and photographs, always with the same mournful expression. It became clear that she was tied to the house. Her spirit bound to the tragic events that had unfolded within its walls. Our exploration led us to a hidden chamber behind the parlor, where the air was heavy with the scent of old earth, and the melody grew oppressively loud. This chamber, unlike the rest of the house, was barren except for a large, sealed stone sarcophagus that resonated with the music. Inscriptions in a language we couldn't decipher covered its surface, glowing faintly in the dim light. As we approached, the melody crescendoed to a deafening pitch, and the lid of the sarcophagus began to shift, as if something inside was attempting to break free. The ghostly woman's apparitions became more frequent and agitated her image flickering in and out of existence around the chamber, her silent mouth seeming to scream a warning. With the sarcophagus lid now ajar, a cold, deathly air seeped into the room, carrying with it a sense of ancient and unrelenting malice. Shadows pooled around the sarcophagus like liquid darkness coalescing into the forms of other spectral entities, bound to the woman and the house by the same tragic history. As the entities circled the sarcophagus, the house trembled, the foundation groaning under the weight of the unleashed spectral energy. The boundary between the past and the present thinned allowing us glimpses into the house's tragic history, scenes of rituals and mourning, of a family driven to the edge of madness by grief, and of dark packs made in the pursuit of reunion and restoration. Caught in the storm of the house's reawakening past, we realized that the house itself was a nexus of grief and unfulfilled desires. It's every room a testament to the family's tragic attempts to conquer death. The melody, now understood as a lament, was a key to unlocking the house's darkest secrets, a symphony of sorrow 
that held the power to either free or further entrap the souls bound to its fate. And in the heart of this tempest, the sarcophagus continued to open, revealing glimpses of the darkness within, a darkness that promised to reveal the true nature of the house and its ghostly inhabitants, their fates intertwined in a narrative of loss and desperation, waiting for us to uncover the final chilling chapter of the Airbnb's unbelievable horror story. As the sarcophagus lid creaked open, an overwhelming force of despair and anger surged forth, filling the chamber with a palpable sense of dread and sorrow. The spectral entities swirled faster around us, their forms more defined, as if the opening sarcophagus was feeding them energy, strengthening their presence in the physical world ghostly woman's apparitions became more persistent and clear, her spectral figure now almost solid, her features etched with anguish. She seemed to be trying to communicate, her mouth moving in silent pleas, her eyes locked on the sarcophagus with a mixture of fear and longing. We, now fully immersed in the narrative of the house, could feel its history seeping into our bones. The walls of the chamber pulsed with the rhythm of the haunting melody. Now, a requiem for the dead and a binding spell that tied the living to the spectral realm of the house. As the sarcophagus fully opened, a dense mist spilled out coalescing into a figure that mirrored the ghostly woman, yet was more menacing, imbued with a darkness that seemed ancient and inexorable. This spectral figure, the source of the house's torment, radiated a malevolent grief, its eyes hollow pits of despair, its presence a suffocating veil of sorrow that threatened to consume everything ghostly woman and the figure from the sarcophagus faced each other, their connection evident in their mirrored expressions of pain and loss. A silent exchange passed between them, a story of love, death, and a forbidden pact that had bound them to this eternal cycle of suffering. Around us, the chamber began to change, the walls dissolving into scenes of the past revealing the house's tragic history. We witnessed the family's descent into madness, their dealings with forbidden arts to bring back the deceased matriarch, resulting in the twisted resurrection that now stood before us, tethered to the woman's spirit. The house, alive with the energy of its dark past, seemed to be feeding on the unfolding drama its structure warping and twisting, forming new passages and rooms that echoed with the remnants of the family's despair. The air was thick with the scent of decay, and the melody grew louder, its notes now a cacophony that underscored the tragedy played out before us. As the past and present collided, the boundary between the spectral and the living world blurred, allowing us to interact with the ghostly inhabitants, each touch revealing snippets of their memories, their regrets, and their unending sorrow. The house was a prison of their making, a labyrinth of grief from which there was no escape, each room a cell, each artifact key to their endless torment. In this nightmarish reality, we found ourselves not just as observers, but as participants. Our presence, a catalyst for the final act of the house's tragic story. Our every action, every decision, seemed to influence the narrative unfolding around us, drawing us deeper into the web 
of the house's curse as we navigated this shifting reality, trying to piece together the fragments of the story to find a way to end the cycle. The ghostly woman and her dark counterpart moved towards a confrontation, their actions mirroring the struggle within the house itself, a battle between the desire for peace and the pull of unresolved anguish. With the storm outside mirroring the tumult within, the house and its inhabitants edged closer to a climax that threatened to unravel the thin veil between life and death. A climax that could either free the trapped souls or bind them, and us, to the house's cursed legacy forever. The confrontation between the ghostly woman and her dark counterpart reached a fever pitch, their ethereal forms clashing in a display of spectral power that illuminated the chamber with ghostly light. Their struggle was a manifestation of the house's internal conflict, a battle between the remnants of love and the chains of a curse forged in grief and desperation. We, caught in the maelstrom of their battle, felt the house responding to every shift in their conflict, its structure warping and contorting, creating a maze of rooms and corridors that reflected the chaos of the unfolding drama. The melody that once guided us had now become a tumultuous orchestra, its notes a soundtrack to the house's agony and rage. In this ever-changing environment, we discovered more about the family's tragic attempts to cheat death. Each room we entered was a chapter in their story, revealing the lengths to which they had gone to bring back the matriarch, and the terrible price they paid for their dealings with dark forces. The family's history was etched into the very essence of the house their souls bound to its walls, their actions the catalyst for the curse that now held them captive. As the spectral entities clashed, their energies unleashed forces that threatened to tear the veil between the worlds even further. Shadowy figures and twisted creatures, born from the house's corrupted legacy, began to emerge from the walls and floors, their forms as malleable and tortured as the house's shifting structure. We realized that to end the curse and escape the house, we needed to break the cycle of the family's tragedy, to resolve the unfinished business that tethered them to this place. Guided by the fragments of memories we had absorbed, we sought to piece together the family story, looking for the linchpin that held the curse in place. Our journey through the house became a race against time. As the battle between the ghostly woman and her counterpart grew more destructive, the fabric of the house straining under the weight of their conflict, the air crackled with spectral energy, and the boundary between past and present blurred, scenes from the family's life playing out before us, each more intense and revealing than the last. In a climactic moment, we found ourselves in the heart of the house, a grand hall where the family's final, fateful decision had been made. Here, the essence of the curse was strongest, the air heavy with the echoes of the past, the hall with its decaying opulence, stood as a testament to the family's final moments of hope and despair. The ghostly woman and her dark counterpart finally converged in this space, their battle reaching its zenith. It became clear that the resolution of their conflict was the key to unraveling the curse. Their fight was not just a clash of wills, but a struggle for redemption and release from the chains of their shared tragedy. As the storm outside howled in fury, mirroring the tumult,
tumult within, we prepared to intervene, to use our knowledge of the family story to attempt to heal the wounds of the past. The fate of the house and its spectral inhabitants hung in the balance. Our actions poised to tip the scales towards salvation or doom as the boundary between the living and the dead shimmered, ready to be rewritten in the final act of this harrowing night. In the grand hall, the air shimmered with the intensity of the spectral battle. The two ghostly figures locked in a dance of fate, their forms blurring between rage and sorrow. The house responded in kind its walls pulsing with the energy of their conflict, the very fabric of the building groaning under the strain of the unresolved past. We navigated the chaos, dodging the physical manifestations of the house's torment, furniture hurled by unseen forces, portraits whose eyes followed our every move, and floors that threatened to give way beneath our feet. Our goal was clear, to find the object or secret that had anchored the family's curse to this place, something we had glimpsed in the shifting tapestry of the house's memories. Through the chaos, we discovered a hidden room, untouched by time, its contents preserved as if waiting for this very moment. Inside among the relics of the family's life lay a diary, the personal account of the matriarch, detailing their descent into darkness, the pact made to stave off death, and the resulting curse that bound them all. As the battle in the grand hall reached a crescendo, we pored over the diary, uncovering the truth of the curse. It was not just a pact with dark forces, but a web of guilt, grief, and love, so strong that it had ensnared the family across generations. The diary revealed that the matriarch's resurrection had been tainted, her spirit fused with the dark entity that now threatened to break free. Armed with this knowledge, we realized that the key to breaking the curse lay in reconciling the dual aspects of the matriarch's spirit, the love she held for her family and the darkness that had consumed her in the aftermath of the ritual. The house, a physical manifestation of this duality, trembled as if understanding its role in the impending resolution. As we returned to the Grand Hall, the spectral entities paused, sensing the change brought by our revelation. We approached them with the diary, the truth within its pages, a beacon in the darkness, reading aloud from the matriarch's account. We invoked the love and remorse she felt, her hopes for her family, and her despair at the unforeseen consequences of her return. The atmosphere in the hall shifted, the air thickening with anticipation and the weight of a century-long tragedy nearing its end. The ghostly figures, their forms now flickering between torment and clarity, gravitated towards the diary's words, their battle quieting as the truth of their existence began to dawn on them. As we read the final entries, the matriarch's spirit split between the ghostly woman and the dark entity began to merge, the duality of her existence resolving into a single form. The house echoed with the sound of her voice, now clear, expressing her love for her family and her regret for the pain caused by her return. The merging of the matriarch's spirits caused a seismic shift in the house's reality. The building
building's architecture warping, hallways stretching, and rooms reshaping, as if the structure itself was exercising the long-held pain and grief. The storm outside, synchronized with the turmoil within, abated, its fury replaced by an uneasy calm. In the grand hall, where past and present, love and sorrow, life and death intersected, the final act of the family's saga unfolded. The house, no longer a prison of unresolved grief, but a conduit for reconciliation, awaited the resolution of the matriarch's tale, its very walls bearing witness to the potential end of the curse, or the beginning of a new chapter in the haunted legacy of the Airbnb horror story. As the matriarch's spirits merged, the grand hall became the epicenter of a profound transformation. The house, long a vessel for the family's anguish, began to shudder, its time-worn walls crying out as years of trapped emotions were released. The air vibrated with the energy of a hundred years of sorrow and longing, the very essence of the house unraveling, the ghostly figures now converging into a single form radiated a light that cut through the shadows of the hall. The matriarch's visage, once split between love and darkness, now reflected a peaceful resignation. Her spectral eyes meeting ours with a depth of gratitude and sorrow, she whispered words of forgiveness and release, her voice echoing through the corridors reaching the hidden corners of the house where the remnants of her family lingered, their spirits drawn to her presence. Around us, the architecture of the house shifted dramatically, rooms and hallways realigning as if the building itself was exhaling a long-held breath. The oppressive atmosphere began to lift, the shadows receding like the tide as the light emanating from the matriarch's form grew brighter, purging the remnants of darkness that had clung to the fabric of the place. We watched, awestruck, as the spectral entities that had once haunted the corridors and rooms faded into the light, their forms dissolving into peace, their unfinished stories finding closure in the matriarch's redemption. The haunting melody that had pervaded the house transformed, its notes now harmonious and soothing, a lullaby of rest and forgiveness. As the transformation continued, the house seemed to age in reverse, its decayed features restoring to a state of former grandeur not without retaining some marks of its tragic past, a testament to its history and the events that unfolded within its walls, the once ominous portraits and photographs adorning the walls now appeared serene, the faces of the family members reflecting a tranquility long denied to them. In this moment of transcendence, the boundary between the spiritual and the material world blurred further, allowing us to witness the full scope of the family saga, not as mere observers, but as participants in the final chapter of their narrative. The diary, the catalyst for this revelation, lay open on the grand hall's floor, its pages aglow with a soft light, the words written within them a powerful incantation of release. The matriarch, now fully integrated and at peace, turned to us, her form ethereal and fading. She imparted a silent message of warning and wisdom, a reminder of the thin veil between life and death and the 
consequences of attempting to alter the natural course of existence. Her figure slowly dissolved, her essence released from the bindings of the house and the earth, setting free not only her spirit, but also the souls of her descendants, who had been trapped in the cycle of the curse. As her form vanished, the house settled, the once tumultuous energy, now a gentle pulse, like the heartbeat of a slumbering giant. The grand hall, and indeed the entire house, was no longer a place of horror and sorrow, but a monument to a family's journey through love, loss, and redemption. Outside, the first light of dawn crept over the horizon, signaling the end of the long night. The storm had passed, leaving the world outside fresh and renewed. Mirroring the transformation within the house, we stood in the calm aftermath, the events of the night a surreal memory, yet indelibly imprinted in our minds. The house, now silent and at peace, seemed to acknowledge our role in its story. The doors and windows opening, as if inviting us to leave, to return to the world outside, carrying with us the tale of its past and the lesson of its resolution. But even as we prepared to depart, the sense of something unfinished lingered, a hint that the story of the house and its spectral inhabitants might not be fully concluded that beyond the redemption and release, there were deep as the first rays of dawn filtered through the windows of the grand hall, casting light on the remnants of the night's turmoil. We felt the house settle into a quiet that spoke of finality and peace. The spectral presences that had once roamed its corridors were gone. Their stories concluded in a cathartic release that had washed the darkness from the house's ancient stones. We gathered our belongings, the weight of the night's experiences heavy in our hearts. The house, now silent and still, seemed to watch us with a benign indifference, its purpose fulfilled, its centuries-old narrative brought to a close, the diary of the matriarch the key to the house's haunted past lay closed on the grand hall's floor, its pages now blank, the words that had once filled them freed with the spirits they had bound. As we stepped outside, the air was fresh, cleansed of the storm's rage and the house's sorrow. The surrounding landscape, once menacing and unwelcoming, now appeared serene and inviting, as if it too had been liberated from the curse that had shrouded the land in darkness. We left the property, the house fading into the background, its imposing structure no longer a prison of horror, but a monument to a powerful story of love, loss, and redemption. The journey back to the world we knew was silent each of us lost in thought, processing the events we had witnessed and the role we had played in ending the cycle of torment. The story of the haunted Airbnb became a legend, whispered about in hushed tones, a tale of a night of terror that unraveled a family's tragic history and broke a century-old curse our experience became a testimony to the thin veil between life and death, and the power of unresolved pasts to shape the present. In time, the house was restored and reopened, not as an Airbnb, but as a historical site, its story known to all who visited, a reminder of the events that had transpired within its walls. Guides would speak of the night when the living walked with the dead, where the past 
and present collided, and a long-suffering spirit found peace. Her story a cautionary tale of the price of tampering with fate, and so the house stood, no longer a beacon of horror, but a symbol of peace and resolution, its legacy not one of fear, but of the enduring power of love and the importance of letting go. Yet, even as life moved on, some said that on certain nights, when the moon was just right, the melody of a piano could be heard, playing a soft lullaby, a final echo of the house's storied past, a gentle reminder that while the dead may be gone, their stories live on forever. Burr mysteries and tales yet to be discovered within the walls of the once haunted Airbnb.